Oh, wow. <laughs> Get that guy away from there. <laughs> okay, what I want to know is, uh, how old were you during this time period that um, the movement was going on in the 60s? Oh, in 64? What is 64 from 2008? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Probably about, what, 21, 22? I mean, is that? Thirty four. Thirty four. Thirty four. Thirty four. So you were you were a grown woman. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I was I I had children. You at had that all time. your five children. Mm. How old were your children? Oh. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I had one in fifty three, one in fifty five, one in fifty seven, one in fifty nine, and one in sixty one. So they were probably under the age of ten. Oh, yeah. Two years yeah. About two, year, about two years apart. But, um, okay, well. About how old were your parents? They were in their um, early 60s. And still active? In sure. The sure. What kind of activities did, was there anything that they did specifically to help with the movement besides being involved in? Uh, the organizations that they were in? Um, mostly, well, housing the, um, some of the people that came here mm -hmm. and um, just basically going to meetings and things like that. Earlier, you said your father worked at the railroad. What was his job? Doing? He was a, uh, what they call a laborer, just basically do take material from one place to another, you know, for the machinists. He was hauling material on a little cart from one place to another. Do you know any types of things that went on while he was working there? Yeah, as far as the segregation part, yes, they didn't, they, they wouldn't, um, they still had, they had their uh, separate bathroom facilities for the black and the white. And um, they had, um, I know they had that. And they basically just wouldn't, wouldn't move the men up, you know? You just got stuck in a position and you just stayed there. They didn't, they, they didn't allow them to, um, to advance, and, you know, on the job. So the black men weren't allowed promotions, but no. the white men were? Yes. How do you feel about this? Well, <laughs> you, I mean, you feel bad, but what, hey, what, what can you do about it? Because they, now those rules wasn't coming down from the headquarters out of Chicago. That's what they were doing here. That's why, that's what they were, the foremans and things in Macomb was doing. Was your father ever passed up for a promotion that he should have gotten? Yes. How did your family react to that? Well, you, they just they couldn't do anything about it. And, and you know, my husband worked there, but he was just out of the service when he came here. And he started there in 60, 64, 66, 65, 6, 65, I believe it was. And he, at the time, he was, he was about, he was wearing size 32 trousers. <laughs> <laughs> and he had just gotten out of service. And he had a goat teeth and a mustache and a head full of hair. And with that name, Karstarfin, he had went and applied for a job. He passed all the tests, passed all the physicals and everything. And when he went, in for his interview, they told him he had to go home and shave off his mustache and cut off his goat teeth. Did he do it? <laughs> yeah. Did they give a reason for? Just, 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 just because. When your husband was in the service, were, uh, how were things different in the service between whites and blacks? I, he never did, we never, he never talked about that. He never discussed that. Did you want to know? 
What was going on inside his head? Did I want to know what was going on inside his head? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Not really. I mean, you know, you can you imagine just being just because you what what would happen now if you went for a job, Byron, with your hair like it is? <laughs> And you know you got a mu if you had a mustache, yeah. Well, what about you? you, you yeah, and they told you you had to cut your hair off, sh shave your head in order to uh, get the job. I don't think I would do it. But well, if a white man walked in for the same job and they had a goatee and a mustache, they it would hired him. It would be made, no, no. It wasn't wasn't anything said about it. But Did they being 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 like I say being. At the time, my husband's color was about like Byron's color. He had a head full of hair about like Byron has, and his was all natural curly. With a, and he had a mustache with goatee, you know. And I can say that he was a fairly good looking man. <laughs> and you know and, and and like i said with that name the name is what they where did you get that name you know it's just like barack obama's name don't nobody like him because of his name i mean your name as my grandmother told me your name will go further than you will ever see now you believe that don't you get mail from places that you've never been? So your name goes farther than you will ever see. So it, it's just that. And just, the, you know, you just think uh, a lot of stuff happens to you and puts you down, but you can't, you can't let that stop you from doing what you have to do. So at the time, he needed a job because he had five little mouths to feed. Had six little miles to feed, including me, morning. <laughs> so he had to, you know, you do you do what you have to do at the time you have to do it. So at this time, you didn't have a job. You didn't. Were you yeah, I had. I was working, working hard for a hundred dollars a month. Where were you working? At that doctor's office. <laughs> <laughs> so how old was, were you when you met your husband? How old was I when I met him? We met when I was about, I was 18, 19, 19. How'd you meet him? We met, we met in Ohio. <laughs> I'm from Mississippi and he's from Alabama, but that's where we met at, in Ohio. So he, but he went into service and stayed. And he, we got married after he came out of service. How has, how has, how did Martin Luther King have an effect, or can you describe the effects that his speeches and his whole persona is a, have on your family? Oh, his speeches and his persona about uh, nonviolent. At that time, that was the right thing and the right speeches to be made because, you know, if he if he hadn't come in with the nonviolent part, just think of what would have happened had everybody had to, had a hot head. It would have just been a big bloodbath and nothing happened. But that was that was at the time I didn't see it being the right thing to do, the right way to go. But looking back, that's... Do you um, remember anybody or anybody personally do you that was killed because of the activities that were going on? And personally? No. Not, 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 uh, media, you know. Not anybody? No, no. Okay. Can you describe the day that... You heard about the assassination of Martin Luther King? Oh, man. Oh, oh, that was heartbreaking. But it, it was really, really heartbreaking. And, you know, just to be out 
and hear some of the remarks of people, it just is terrible. What kind of remarks did you hear? Some of them, you know, like, I'm glad he did, and he should have been killed a long time ago, and I'll, you know, it's just it's sad. And the same thing about President Kennedy, you know, it's just... Did things get worse when he died? Pardon? Did things get worse, though? When, and after Martin Luther King died? Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think his death brought a lot of people to their real senses, you know? Where I don't think you? so. Where was I? I what was it. I was, I was watching, in fact, I was watching TV the night he was killed. I was watching it. The, the speech he was making for the garbage workers at that time in Memphis. I was watching TV. I was watching it. So, it, so when you heard these people saying they they glad he was killed, how did that make you feel inside? <laughs> Empty. Empty. It's it's just it just hurt. Do you think people around here after his assassination lost hope, or do you think that it? you know, made them more determined to keep on going? I think it made them more determined, more determined. You know, you can kill the person, but you can't kill the source. But, you know, and I just think it made, it more, made them more determined to do what they had to do, what they what was needed to do. Were you the one... You said you were watching TV while it happened. Were you the one to tell your family that he had been assassinated? Well, we were always sitting there watching. We were always sitting there watching. How did and the other members of your family react? Everybody just, at that time, everybody just, just, the whole room emptied. You know, everybody went their separate ways, but it was just hurt. But you said y'all was watching TV. When this happened, did the TV, like, the station y'all was watching cut off and it went straight to breaking news that Dr. Martin Luther King died or it was some kind of Well, he was up speaking. Oh. We, we we it was on TV. The speech was on TV. We was we was watching it. So and watching. and then after that the anchormen's come in, um, um it wasn't Tom Brokaw, who was the other guy. I can't remember Chuck one of them guys came in. Okay. I can't remember who it was, but I remember I know they cut away from that the, the, at that time and started going back to certain phases of his speeches and whatever happened. We've heard that on a certain day, some of the some people here in the community wore black to mourn his death and to make a point. Did you participate in that? Mm, no, no. Did any of your neighbors or your community participate in that? I not not that day. Not that day I didn't. Not that day. It was just it was just something that I just, you know, I just celebrated it my way. But not that way. So when when Dr. Martin Luther King died, did that ignite a fire in you where you thought it was time for change right then and there? Well, we had started before the, you know, at that at that time, it just it's just something. It's just that you've had enough, you know. You you take this much, and your cup is full. And you're just not gonna take any more. So, that was that was at that time. That's the that's the attitude I took. Of, that I was just full of it, and I just whatever come up, you know that. I was gonna write, write the ship right then. What? Oh, I'm sorry. What activities did you participate in, if any, after his death? Any, any activities that they would have, we would have, at, you know, after that, I participated in them, tried to. Could you tell us about some of them? It was like, um, the NAACP would hold different things, you know, so that was. When did you see a difference in the uh, Macomb police? In the Macomb police? Mm -hmm. um, 
after that, after after Martin Dr. Martin Luther King's death. And they started a difference. How how so a difference? What's your interpretation of they the difference? Well, they started some before then. There was just mostly all white policemen. They started integrating the police force. You know, different things around. Um, things like that. Did y'all want to take ten seconds and see where y'all are going? And I don't know if anybody had questions or knew where they wanted to go. Or just can you let me take it? So, were your kids a part of any movements or sit-ins during the '60s? No. No, my my children were too. My sisters were, but my children were too small at that time. When they got but, older, did you encourage that spirit to? Well, participate? when they when they come in with the school integration, they didn't call it school integration at first. They called it freedom of choice school. So, at that time, I my my children, I pulled them all out of the Higgins school up here and sent them to the white schools. So I felt like that by doing that, it would give them a chance to be integrated into the system with, with other, you know, the white children. Because I felt like that my kids were smart enough that they, you know, would be able to do their homework and stay aboard, above the board in their classwork. So I pulled all mine out and sent them. I had one going to Kennedy. I had one going to the high school and one going to Denman Junior High. So before I go to work in the morning, and I had to be at work for 8 o'clock, I would have to drop them off to school because at the time they still weren't allowed to ride the bus. So I had to drive them to school and then be, get to work for 8 o'clock in the morning time. So when you took them out out of the black schools and put them in, well, integrated them, did that scare you a little bit that when they get to school that they'll be picked on by because of their race or? Did you worry about them being at school? Yeah. Mm, um, no, because <laughs> I was the type of mother that I would leave work any minute and go to school, go to, <laughs> go check on them at school. But I sat my kids down and talked to them and told them, the things that they would be confronted with, you know, like call name calling and all this kind of stuff. So I told them that the way you, I said, now, when you get there, you got to really do your homework and keep your grades up because you, they are going to expect more out of you than they do that white child because you are black. And, you know, things like that, I tried to tell them how, how it would be. So, I mean, they had no problem. They had no they problem. Had no, problem. No, no problem whatsoever. So did, they, so, did they have, did they fail any classes or anything because no, of race? No. So everything was no. okay? No. They made straight A's. No. Did they want but, to integrate? Pardon? Did they want to integrate? Did they, did they? Well, not really. Not really. They they wanted to stay with their friends, you know. But it it wasn't. Uh, I think the next year they all started going over. But you know, I like I told them, it's you do it while you're young. You get out there and you mingle and 